Section forty six of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. Chapter forty five. The Lady of Constantinople. For upward of half an hour did the boat skim the surface of the Golden Horn, the dip of the oars in the water, and the rippling around the sharp prow alone breaking the solemn silence of the night. At length the skiff stopped and the female slave took alessandro's hand whispering in a low tone i will serve as thy guide christian but speak not till thou hast permission she then led him from the boat up a flight of steps and through a garden for he occasionally came in contact with the outstretching branches of shrubs and there was moreover a delicious odour of flowers as he proceeded in the total darkness of his blindfolding at the expiration of ten minutes the guide stopped and alessandro heard a key turn in a lock enter here said the slave pushing him gently forward and speaking in a low tone take off the cap attire yourself in the raiment you will find ready provided and then pass fearlessly through the door at the further end of the room you will meet me again in the hall which you will thus reach and without waiting for a reply the slave closed and locked the door through which alessandro had just passed hastily did he remove the cap which had indeed almost suffocated him and he now found himself in a small apartment elegantly furnished in the most luxurious oriental fashion and brilliantly lighted a table spread with confectionery cakes fruits and even wines though the fermented juice of the grape be expressly forbidden by the laws of the prophet mohammed occupied the centre of the room around the walls were continuous sofas or ottomans so conductive to the enjoyment of a voluptuous indulgence the floor was spread with a carpet so thick that the feet sunk into the silky texture as into newly fallen snow and whichever way he turned alessandro beheld his form reflected in vast mirrors set in magnificent frames there were no windows on any side of this apartment but there was a cupola fitted with stainless glass on the roof and alessandro judged that he was in one of those voluptuous kiosks usually found in the gardens of wealthy turks precisely as the slave had informed him he found an elegant suit of moslem garments set out on the sofa for his use and he hastened to exchange his italian costume for the oriental raiment as he thus attired himself it was necessary to contemplate himself in the mirror facing him so as properly to adjust clothes to which he was totally unaccustomed and it struck him that the garb of the infidel became him better than that of the christian he did not however waste time in the details of this strange toilet but as soon as it was completed he opened the door at the further end of the room in pursuance of the instructions he had received alessandro found himself in a large marble hall from which several flights of stairs led to the apartments above the place was refulgent with the light of numerous chandeliers the glare of which was enhanced by the vast mirrors attached to the walls and the crystal pillars that supported the roof not a human being met alessandro's eyes and he began to fear either that he had mistaken the directions he had received or that some treachery was intended when a door opened and the female slave wrapped in a veil made her appearance placing her forefinger upon that part of the veil which covered her lips to enjoin silence she led the way up the nearest staircase alessandro following with a heart beating audibly they reached a door at which a negro male slave was stationed the hakim physician said alessandro's guide laconically addressing herself to the negro who bowed in silence and threw open the door the female slave conducted the pretended physician into a small but splendidly furnished ante-room in which there were several other dependents of her own sex a door at the further end was opened and alessandro passed through into another larger and still more magnificently furnished room the door closed behind him and he found himself alone with the idol of his adjuration half seated half lying upon cushions of scarlet brocade the glossy bright hue of which was mellowed by the muslin spread over it appeared the beauteous creature whose image was so faithfully delineated in his memory she was attired in the graceful and becoming duellama a purple vest which set close to her form and with a species of elasticity shaped itself so as to develop every contour but in accordance with the custom of the clime and age the duellama was open at the bosom sloping from each lovely white shoulder to the waist where two folds joining formed an angle at which the purple vest was fastened by a diamond worth a monarch's ransom the sleeves were wide but short scarcely reaching to the elbow and leaving all the lower part of the snowy arms completely bare 
her ample trousers were of purple silk covered with the finest muslin and drawn in tight a little above the ankles which were naked on her feet she wore crimson slippers cut very low and each ornamented with a diamond round her person below the waist she wore a magnificent shawl rolled up as it were negligently so as to form a girdle or zone and fastened in front with two large tassels of pearls diamond bracelets adored her fair arms and her head-dress consisted of a turban or shawl of light but rich material fastened with gold bodkins the head of each being a pearl of the best water beneath this turban her rich auburn hair glowing like gold in the light of the perfumed lamps and amidst the blaze of diamonds which adorned her was parted in massive bands sweeping gracefully over her temples and gathered behind the ears then falling in all the luxuriance of its rich clustering folds over the cushion whereon she reclined her finger-nails were slightly tinged with henna the rosy hue the more effectually setting off the lily whiteness of her delicate hand and full round arm but no need had she to dye the lashes of her eyes with the famous cahol so much used by oriental ladies for those lashes were by nature formed of the deepest jet a somewhat unusual but beauteous contrast to the colour of her hair the cheeks of the lovely creature were slightly flushed or it might have been a reflection of the scarlet brocade of the cushion on which as we have said she was half seated half lying when alessandro appeared in her presence for a few moments the young italian was so dazzled by her beauty so bewildered by the appearance of that lady whose richness of attire seemed to denote the rank of sultana that he remained rooted to the spot uncertain whether to advance to retire or to fall upon his knees before her but in an encouraging tone and in a voice musical as a silver bell the lady said approach christian and she pointed to a low ottoman within a few paces of the sofa which she herself occupied alessandro now recovered his presence of mind and no longer embarrassed and awkward but with graceful ease and yet profound respect he took the seat indicated beauteous lady he said how can i ever demonstrate the gratitude the illimitable boundless gratitude which fills my heart for the joy the true elysian delight afforded me by this meeting you speak our language well christian observed the lady smiling faintly at the compliment conveyed by the words of alessandro but evading a direct reply i have for some years past been in the service of the florentine envoy lady was the answer and the position which i occupy at the palace of the embassy has led me to study the beauteous language of this clime and to master its difficulties but never never did that language sound so soft and musical upon my ears as now flowing from those sweet lips of thine the moslem maidens dare not listen to the flattery of the infidel said the beauteous stranger in a serious but not severe tone listen to me christian with attention for our meeting must not be prolonged many minutes to say that i beheld thee with indifference when we first encountered each other in the bazaar were to utter a falsehood which i scorn to admit that i can love thee and love thee well she added her voice slightly trembling is an avowal which i do not blush to make but never can the moslem maiden bestow her hand on the infidel if thou lovest me if thou wouldst prove thyself worthy of that affection which my heart is inclined to bestow upon thee thou wilt renounce the creed of thy forefathers and embrace the Mussulman faith nor is this all that i require of thee or that thou must achieve to win me become a true believer acknowledge that allah is god and mohammed is his prophet and a bright and glorious destiny will await thee for although thou wilt depart hence without learning my name or who i may be or the place to which you have been brought to meet me though we shall behold each other no more until thou hast rendered thyself worthy of my hand yet shall i ever be mindful of thee my loved one an unseen and unknown influence shall attend thee thy slightest wishes will be anticipated and fulfilled in a manner for which thou wilt vainly seek to account and as thou proved thy talents or thy valour so will promotion open its doors to thee with such rapidity that thou wilt strain every nerve to reach the highest offices in the state for then only mayest thou hope to receive my hand and behold the elucidation of the mystery which up to that date will envelop thy destinies while the lady was thus speaking a fearful struggle took place in the breast of alessandro for the renunciation of his creed a creed in which he must ever in his heart continue to believe though ostensibly he might abjure it was an appalling step to contemplate then to his mind also came the images of those whom he loved 
and who were far away in italy his aunt who had been so kind to him his sister whom he knew to be so proud of him and father marco who manifested such deep interest in his behalf but on his ears continued to flow the honeyed words and the musical tones of the charming temptress and as she gradually developed to his imagination the destinies upon which he might enter offering herself as the eventual prize to be gained by a career certain to be pushed on successfully through the medium of a powerful though mysterious influence florence relatives and friends became the secondary considerations in his mind and by the time the lady brought her long address to a conclusion that address which had grown more impassioned and tender as she proceeded alessandro threw himself at her feet exclaiming lovely hoary that thou art beauteous as the maidens that dwell in the paradise of thy prophet i am thine i am thine the lady extended her right hand which he took and pressed in rapture to his lips then the next moment she rose slightly to her feet and assuming a demeanour befitting a royal sultana said in a sweet though impressive tone we must now part thou to enter on thy career of fame i to set in motion every spring within my reach to advance thee to the pinnacle of glory and power henceforth thy name is ibrahim go then my ibrahim and throw thyself at the feet of the rezi effendi and that great minister will forthwith present thee to piri pasha the grand vizier toil diligently labour arduously and the rest concerns me go then my ibrahim i say and enter on the path which will lead thee to the summit of fame and power she extended her arms toward him he snatched her to his breast and covered her cheeks with kisses in that paradise of charms he could have revelled for ever but the tender caresses lasted not beyond a few moments for the lady tore herself away from his embrace and hurried into an adjacent apartment alessandro or rather the renegade ibrahim passed into the ante-room where his guide the female slave awaited his return she conducted him back to the hall and advanced towards the door of the voluptuous kiosk where he had changed his raiment goest thou forth a christian still or a true believer she asked turning suddenly round as a mussulman answered the renegade while his heart sank within him and remorse already commenced its torture then thou hast no further need of the christian garb said the slave await me here she entered the kiosk and returned in a few moments with the cap which in obedience to her directions he once more drew on his head and over his countenance the slave then led him into the garden where they treaded in profound silence at length they reached the steps leading down to the water and the slave accompanied him into the boat which immediately shot away from the bank alessandro had now ample time for calm reflection the excitement of the hurried incidents of the evening was nearly over and though his breast was still occupied with the image of his beautiful unknown and with the brilliant prospects which she had opened to view he nevertheless shrank from the foul deed of apostasy which he had vowed to perpetrate but we have already said that he was essentially worldly-minded and as he felt convinced that the petty jealousy of the florentine envoy would prevent him from rising higher in the diplomatic hierarchy than the post of secretary he by degrees managed to console himself for his renegadism on the score that it was necessary the indispensable stepping stone to the gratification of his ambition thus by the time the boat touched the landing-place where he had first entered it he had succeeded to some extent in subduing the pangs of remorse the female slave now bade him remove the cap from his face and resume his turban a few moments sufficed to make this change and she was about to step on shore when the woman caught him by the sleeve of his caftan and thrusting a small case of sandalwood into his hand said she whom you saw ere now commanded me to give thee this the slave pushed him toward the bank he obeyed the impulse and landed she remaining in the boat which instantly darted away again most probably to convey her back to the abode of her charming mistress on the top of the bank the renegade was accosted by the spy whom he had left there when he embarked in the skiff allah and the prophet be praised exclaimed the man surveying alessandro attentively by the light of the lovely moon thou art now numbered amongst the faithful the apostate bit his lips to keep down a sigh of remorse which rose to them and his guide without uttering another word led the way to the palace of the rezi effendi there alessandro or ibrahim as we must henceforth call him was lodged in a splendid apartment and had two slaves appointed to wait upon him he however hastily dismissed them and when alone opened the case that had been placed into his hands by the female slave it contained a varied assortment of jewellery and precious stones constituting a treasure of immense value 
End of section 46section 47 of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 46 the apostate ibrahim constantinople like haughty rome is built on seven hills the houses being so disposed that they do not intercept the view commanded by each on the amphitheatrical acclivities but the streets are narrow crooked and uneven and the grand effects of the numerous stately mosques and noble edifices are subdued and in many cases altogether lost either by the very insignificant width of the thoroughfares in which they stand or by the contiguity of mean and miserable wooden tenements the mosque of saint sophia once a christian church with its magnificent portico supported by marble columns its nine vast folding doors adorned with bas reliefs and its stupendous dome a hundred and twenty feet in diameter the mosque of the sultan suleiman forming an exact square with four noble towers at the angles and with its huge cupola in the midst the mosque of the sultan ahmed with its numerous domes its tall minarets and its colonnades supported by marble pillars and the mosque of the sultana valida or queen mother of mohammed the fourth exceeding all other mussulman churches in the delicacy of its architecture and the beauty of its columns of marble and jasper supplied by the ruins of troy these are the most remarkable temples in the capital of the ottoman empire the grand bezestine or exchange is likewise a magnificent structure consisting of a spacious hall of circular form built of free stone and surrounded by shops displaying the richest commodities of oriental commerce in the ladies bazaar there is a marble column of extraordinary height and on the sides of which from the foot to the crown are represented in admirable bas-reliefs the most remarkable events which characterize the reign of the emperor arcadius ere the capital of roman dominions of the east fell into the hands of the descendants of osman but of all the striking edifices at constantinople that of the sultan's palace or seraglio is the most spacious and the most magnificent Christian writers and readers are too apt to confound the seraglio with the harem, and to suppose that the former means the apartments belonging to the sultan's ladies, whereas the word seraglio, or rather sernil, represents the entire palace of which the harem, or female's dwelling, is but a comparatively small portion. The seraglio is a vast enclosure, occupying nearly the entire site of the ancient city of Byzantium, and embracing a circumference of five miles. It contains nine enormous courts of quadrangular form, and an immense number of buildings, constituting a complete town of itself. But within this enclosure dwell upward of ten thousand persons, the entire court of the Sultan. There reside the great officers of state, the bodyguards, the numerous corps of bostanges or gardeners, and baltoges or firewood purveyors, the corps of white and black eunuchs, the pages, the mutes, the dwarfs, the ladies of the harem and all their numerous attendants there are nine gates to the palace of the sultan the principal one opens on the square of saint sophia and is very magnificent in its architecture it is this gate which is called the sublime port a name figuratively given to the court of the sultan in all histories records and diplomatic transactions it was within the enclosure of the seraglio that alessandro francatelli who we shall henceforth call by his apostate name of ibrahim was lodged in the dwelling of the reis effendi or minister of foreign affairs but in the course of a few days the renegade was introduced into the presence of piri pasha the grand vizier that high functionary who exercised a power almost as extensive and as despotic as that wielded by the sultan himself ibrahim the apostate was received by his highness piri pasha at a private audience and the young man exerted all his powers and called to his aid all the accomplishments which he possessed to render himself agreeable to that great minister he discoursed in an intelligent manner upon the policy of italy and austria and gave the grand vizier considerable information relative to the customs resources and condition of these countries then when the vizier touched upon lighter matters ibrahim showed how well he was already acquainted with the works of the most eminent turkish poets and historians and the art of music being mentioned he gave the minister a specimen of his proficiency on the violin Piri Pasha was charmed with the young renegade, whom he immediately took into his service as one of his private secretaries. 
not many weeks elapsed before the fame of ibrahim's accomplishments and rare talents reached the ears of the sultan soliman the magnificent and the young renegade was honoured with an audience by the ruler of the east on this occasion he exerted himself to please even more triumphantly than when he was introduced to the grand vizier and the sultan commanded that henceforth ibrahim should remain attached to his person in the capacity of keeper of the imperial archives we should observe that the dispatches which the florentine envoy wrote to the government of the republic contained but a brief and vague allusion to the apostasy of alessandro francatelli merely mentioning that the youth had become a mussulman and entered the service of the grand vizier but not stating either the name which he had adopted or the brilliant prospects which had so suddenly and marvellously opened before him the florentine ambassador treated the matter thus lightly because he was afraid of incurring the blame of his government for not having kept a more stringent watch over his subordinate were he to attach any importance to the fact of alessandro's apostasy but he hoped that by merely glancing at the event as one scarcely worth special notice the council of florence would be led to treat it with equal levity nor was the ambassador deceived in his calculation and thus the accounts which reached florence relative to alessandro's renegadism and which were not indeed communicated to the council until some months after the occurrence of the apostasy itself were vague and indefinite to a degree and had ibrahim no remorse did he never think of his lovely sister flora and of his affectionate aunt who in his boyhood had made such great and generous sacrifices to rear them honourably oh yes but a more powerful idea dominated the remembrance of kindred and the attachment to home and that idea was ambition moreover the hope of speedily achieving that greatness which was to render him eligible and worthy to possess the charming being whose powerful influence seemed to surround him with a constant halo of protection and to soothe down all the aspersities which are usually found in the career of those who rise suddenly and rise highly this ardent longing hope not only encouraged him to put forth all his energies to make himself master of a glorious position it also subdued to no small extent the feelings of compunction which would otherwise have been too bitter too agonizing to endure his mind was moreover constantly occupied when not in attendance upon the sultan he devoted all his time to render himself intimately acquainted with the laws polity diplomatic history resources condition and finances of the ottoman empire he also studied the turkish literature and practised composition both in prose and verse in the language of that country which was now his own but think not reader that in his heart he was a mussulman or that he had extinguished the light of christianity within his soul no oh no the more he read on the subject of the mohammedan system of theology the more he became convinced not only of its utter falsity but also of its incompatibility with the progress of civilization nevertheless he dared not pray to the true god whom he had renounced with his lips but there was a secret adoration an interior worship of the saviour which he could not and sought not to subdue soliman the magnificent was an enlightened prince and a generous patron of the arts and sciences he did not persecute the christians because he knew in his own heart that they were further advanced in all human ideas and institutions than the ottomans he was therefore delighted whenever a talented christian embraced the moslem faith and entered his service and his keen perception speedily led him to discern and appreciate all the merits and acquirements of his favourite ibrahim such was the state of things at constantinople when those rapidly successive incidents which we have already related took place in florence at this time immense preparations were being made by the sultan for an expedition against the island of rhodes then in the possession of the knights of st john commanded by their grand master villiers of isle adam their chieftain aware of the danger which menaced him dispatched envoys to the courts of rome genoa venice and florence imploring those powers to send him assistance against the expected invasion of the turks each of these states hastened to comply with this request and numerous bodies of auxiliaries sailed from various ports in italy to fight beneath the glorious banner of villiers of isle adam one of the staunchest veteran champions of christendom thus at the very time when nista and wagner were united in the bonds of love on the island of which they were the possessors while too isaacar the jew languished in the prisons of the inquisition of florence at which city the chivalrous-hearted manuel d'orsini tarried to hasten on the trial and give his testimony in favour of the israelite and moreover while flora and the countess guilia dwelt in the strictest retirement with the young maiden's aunt at this period we say a fleet of three hundred sail quitted constantinople under the command of the capitan tasha or lord high admiral 
and proceeded toward the island of rhodes at the same time soliman the magnificent crossed into asia minor and placed himself at the head of an army of a hundred thousand men commenced his march toward the coast facing the island and where he intended to embark on his warlike expedition his favorite ibrahim accompanied him as did the grand vizier piri pasha and the principal dignitaries of the empire it was in the spring of fifteen twenty one that the ottoman fleet received the army on board at the cape in the gulf of Macri, which is only separated by a very narrow strait from the island of rhodes and in the evening of the same day on which the troops had thus embarked a mighty armament appeared off the capital city of the knights of st john End of section forty seven Section forty eight of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty seven The Siege of Rhodes. On the following morning, salvos of artillery throughout the fleet announced to the inhabitants and garrison of Rhodes that the Sultan was about to effect a landing with his troops. The debarkment was not resisted, for it was protected by the cannonade which the ships directed against the walls of the city and the christians had no vessel capable of demonstrating any hostility against the mighty fleet commanded by the capitan pasha villiers of isle adam the generalissimo of the christian forces had reduced to ashes all circumjacent villages and received their inhabitants into the city itself but the ottomans cared not for the waste and desolation thus created around the walls of the city but while their artillery alike on land and by sea maintained an incessant fire on the town they threw up works of defence and established depots of provisions and ammunition the sultan went in person accompanied by ibrahim and attended by a numerous escort to reconnoitre the fortifications and inspect the position of his troops on the other side villiers of isle adam distributed his forces in such a manner that the warriors of each nation defended particular gates thus the cause of spaniards french germans english portuguese italian auvergnese and provincials respectively defended eight of the gates at rhodes while the lord general himself with his bodyguard took his post at the ninth for the knights of rhodes comprised natives of nearly all christian countries and the mode in which villiers thus allotted a gate to the defence of the warriors of each nation gave an impulse to that emulative spirit which ever induces the soldiers of one clime to vie with those of another the ottoman troops were disposed in the following manner ayaz pasha beglebev or governor of rumilia found himself placed in front of the walls and gates defended by the french and germans ahmed pasha was opposed to the spaniards and orvegnese mustapha pasha had to contend with the english Kassim, Beglebeg of Anatolia, was to direct the attack against the bastion and gates occupied by the natives of Provence. The Grand Vizier, Peri Pasha, was opposed to the Portuguese, and the Sultan himself undertook the assault against the defences occupied by the Italians. For several days there was much skirmishing, but no advantage was gained by the Ottomans. Mines and countermines were employed on both sides, and those executed by the Christians effected terrible havoc amongst the Turks. At length, in pursuance of the advice of the renegade Ibrahim, the Sultan ordered a general assault to be made upon the city, and heralds went through the entire encampment, proclaiming the imperial command. Tidings of this resolution were conveyed into the city by means of the Christian spies, and while the Ottomans were preparing for the attack, Villiers of Isle Adam was actively employed in adopting all possible means for the defence. At daybreak, the general assault commenced, and the Aga or colonel of the Janissaries succeeded in planting his banner on the gate entrusted to the care of the Spaniards and Orbegnes. But this success was merely temporary in that quarter, for the Ottomans were beaten back with such immense slaughter that fifteen thousand of their choicest troops were cut to pieces in the breach and the ditch but still the assault was prosecuted in every quarter and every point and the christian warriors acquitted themselves nobly in the defence of the city the women of rhodes manifested a courage and zeal which history has loved to record as most honourable to their sex some of them carried about bread and wine to recruit the fainting and refresh the wearied others were ready with bandages and lint to staunch the blood which flowed from the wounded some conveyed earthen wheelbarrows to stop up the breaches made in the walls and others bore along immense stones to hurl down upon the assailants oh it was glorious 
but a sad and mournful sight that death struggle of the valiant christians against the barbarism of the east and many touching proofs of woman's courage and daring characterize that memorable siege especially does this fact merit our attention the wife of a christian captain seeing her husband slain and the enemy gaining ground rapidly embraced her two children tenderly made the sign of the cross upon their brows and then having stabbed them to the heart threw them into the midst of the burning building near exclaiming the infidels will not now be able my poor darlings to wreak their vengeance on you alive or dead in another moment she seized her dead husband's sword and plunging into the thickest of the fight met a death worthy of a heroine the rain now began to fall in torrents washing away the floods of gore which since daybreak had dyed the bastions and the wall and the assault continued as arduously as the defence was maintained with desperation Soliman commanded in person the division which was opposed to the gate and the fort entrusted by the lord general of the christians to the care of the italian auxiliaries but though it was now past noon and the sultan had prosecuted his attack on that point with unabated vigour since the dawn no impression had yet been made the italians fought with a heroism which bade defiance to the numerical superiority of their assailants for they were led on by a young chieftain who beneath an effeminate exterior possessed the soul of a lion clad in a complete suit of polished armour and with crimson plumes waving from his steel helmet to which no visor was attached that youthful leader threw himself into the thickest of the medley sought the very points where danger appeared most terrible and alike by his example and his words encouraged those whom he commanded to dispute every inch of ground with the moslem assailants the sultan was enraged when he beheld the success with which that italian chieftain rallied his men again after every rebuff and calling to ibrahim to keep near him soliman the magnificent advanced toward the breach which his cannon had already effected in the walls defended so gallantly by the italian auxiliaries and now in a few minutes behold the sultan himself nerved with wonderful energy rushing on scimitar in hand and calling on the young italian warrior to measure weapons with him the christian chieftain understood not the words which the sultan uttered but full well did he comprehend the anxiety of that great monarch to do battle with him and the curved scimitar and the straight cross-handled sword clashed together in a moment the young warrior knew that his opponent was the sultan whose imperial rank was denoted by the turban which he wore and the hope of inflicting chastisement on the author of all the bloodshed which had taken place on the walls of rhodes inspired the youth with a courage perfectly irresistible not many minutes had this combat lasted before soliman was thrown down in the breach and the cross-handled sword of his conqueror was about to drink his heart's blood when the renegade ibrahim dashed forward from amidst the confused masses of those who were fighting around and by a desperate effort hurled the young italian warrior backward i owe thee my life ibrahim said the sultan springing upon his feet but hurt not him who has combated so gallantly we must respect the brave the italian chieftain had been completely stunned by his fall he was therefore easily made prisoner and carried off to ibrahim's tent almost at the same moment a messenger from ahmed pasha presented to the sultan a letter in which was stated that the grand master villiers of al adam anxious to put a stop to the fearful slaughter that was progressing had offered to capitulate on honourable terms this proposition was immediately agreed to by the sultan and a suspension of hostilities was proclaimed around the walls the ottomans retired to their camp having lost upward of thirty thousand men during the deadly strife of a few hours and the christians had now leisure to ascertain the extent of their own disasters which were proportionately appalling End of section forty eight section forty nine of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty eight the prisoner in the meantime ibrahim had ordered his prisoner the young italian chieftain to be conveyed to his tent and when the renegade slave had disencumbered the christian of his armour he began to revive as ibrahim bent over him administering restoratives a suspicion which had already struck him the moment he first beheld his face grew stronger and stronger and the apostate at length became convinced that he had seen that countenance on some former occasion ordering his slaves to withdraw ibrahim remained alone with his prisoner who was now able to sit up on the sofa and gaze around him i understand it all he exclaimed the blood rushing back to his pale cheek i am in the power of the barbarians 
nay call us not harsh names brave chieftain said ibrahim seeing that we do not treat you unworthily i was wrong cried the prisoner then fixing his fine blue eyes upon the renegade he added were you not habited as a moslem i should conceive by the purity with which you speak my native language that you were a christian and an italian i can speak many languages with equal fluency said ibrahim evasively as a pang shot through his heart but tell me thy name christian for thou art a brave man although so young in my own country answered the youth proudly i am called the count of riverola we have before stated that ibrahim was the complete master of his emotions but it required all his powers of self-possession to subdue them now when the name of that family into which he was well aware his sister had entered fell upon his ears his suspicion was well founded he had indeed seen francisco before this day had seen him when he was a mere boy in florence for alessandro was three or four years older than the young count but he had never in his native land exchanged a word with francisco he had merely occasionally seen him in public and it was quite evident that even if francisco had ever noticed him at that time he did not recollect him now neither did ibrahim wish the young count to ascertain who he was for the only thing which the renegade ever feared was the encounter of any one who had known him as a christian and who might justly reproach him for that apostasy which had led him to profess mohammedism lord count of riverola said ibrahim after a pause you shall be treated in a manner becoming your rank and your bravery such indeed was the command of my imperial master the most glorious sultan but even had no such order been issued my admiration of your gallant deportment in this day's strife would lead to the same result my best thanks are due for these assurances returned francisco but tell me how fares the war without the grand master has proffered a capitulation which has been accepted answered ibrahim a capitulation exclaimed francisco oh it were better to die in defence of the cross than to live to behold the crescent triumphant on the walls of rhodes the motive of the grand master was a humane one observed ibrahim he has agreed to capitulate to put an end to the terrific slaughter that is going on doubtless the lord general acts in accordance with the dictates of a matured wisdom exclaimed the count of riverola your lordship was the leader of the italian auxiliaries said ibrahim interrogatively such was the honourable office entrusted to me was the reply when messages from villiers of isle adam arrived in florence beseeching succour against this invasion which has alas proved too successful i panted for occupation to distract my mind from ever pondering on the heavy misfortunes which have overtaken me misfortunes exclaimed ibrahim yes misfortunes of such a nature that the mere thought of them is madness cried francisco in an excited tone first a beauteous and amiable girl one who though of humble origin was endowed with virtues and qualifications that might have fitted her to adorn a palace with whom i fondly devotedly loved was snatched from me she disappeared i know not how all trace of her was suddenly lost as if the earth had swallowed her up and closed over her again this blow was in itself terrible but it came not alone a few days elapsed and my sister my dearly beloved sister also disappeared and in the same mysterious manner not a trace of her remained and what makes this second affliction the more crushing the more overwhelming is that she is deaf and dumb oh heaven grant me the power to resist to bear up against these crowning miseries vain were all my inquiries useless was all the search i instituted to discover whither had gone the being whom i would have made my wife and the sister who was ever so devoted to me at length driven to desperation when weeks had passed and they returned not goaded on to madness by bitter bitter memories i resolved to devote myself to the service of the cross with my gold i raised and equipped a gallant band and a favouring breeze wafted us from leghorn to this island the grand master received me with open arms and forming an estimation of my capacities far above my deserts placed me in command of all the italian auxiliaries you know the rest i fought with all my energy and your sultan was within the grasp of death when you rushed forward and saved him the result is that i am your prisoner 
so young and yet so early acquainted with such deep affliction exclaimed ibrahim but can you form no idea christian of the cause of that double disappearance had your sister no attendants who could throw the least light upon the subject he asked with the hope of eliciting some tidings relative to his own sister the beauteous laura i dare not reflect thereon cried francisco the tears starting into his eyes for alas florence has long been infested by a desperate band of lawless wretches and my god i apprehend the worst the very worst thus speaking he rose and paced the spacious tent with agitated steps for this conversation had awakened in his mind all the bitter thoughts and dreadful alarms which he had essayed to subdue amidst the excitement and peril of war a slave now entered to inform ibrahim that the sultan commanded his immediate presence in the imperial pavilion christian said ibrahim as he rose to obey this mandate wilt thou pledge me thy word as a noble and a knight not to attempt to escape from this tent i pledge my word answered francisco seeing that thou thyself art so generous to me ibrahim then went forth but he paused for a few moments outside the tent to command his slaves to serve up choice refreshments to the prisoner he then hastened to the pavilion of the sultan whom he found seated upon a throne surrounded by the beggarly begs the councillors of state the viziers the lieutenants generals of the army and all the high dignitaries who had accompanied him on his expedition ibrahim advanced and prostrated himself at the foot of his throne and at the same moment two of the high functionaries present threw a caftan of honour over his shoulders a ceremony which signified that the sultan had conferred upon him the title of beg or prince of princes rise ibrahim pasha exclaimed soliman and take thy place in our councils for allah and his prophet have this day made thee their instrument to save the life of thy sovereign the newly created pasha touched the imperial slipper with his lips and then rising from his prostrate position received the congratulations of the high functionaries assembled thus it was that in a few months protected by that secret influence which was hurrying him so rapidly along in his ambitious career the italian apostate attained to a high rank in the ottoman empire but he was yet to reach the highest next to that of the sovereign ere he could hope to receive the fair hand of his mysterious patroness as the crowning joy for his prosperity for her image her charming image ever dwelt in his mind and an ardent fancy often depicted her as she appeared in all the splendour of her beauty reclining on the couch at the dwelling to which he had been conducted with so much precaution as detailed in a preceding chapter on the following day peace was formally concluded between the ottomans and the knights of rhodes the latter consenting to surrender the island to the formidable invaders an exchange of prisoners was the result and francisco count of riverola again found himself free within twenty-four hours after his capture your lordship is now about to sail for your own clime said ibrahim when the moment of separation came is there aught within my power that i can do to testify my friendship for one so brave and chivalrous as thou art nothing great pasha exclaimed francisco who felt his sympathy irresistibly attracted toward ibrahim he knew not why but on the other hand receive my heartfelt thanks for the kindness which i have experienced during the few hours i have been thy guest the history of thy afflictions has so much moved me said ibrahim pasha after a brief pause that the interest i experience in your behalf will not cease when you shall be no longer here if you would bear in mind the request i am about to make gallant christian name it cried francisco tis already granted write to me from florence added ibrahim and acquaint me with the success of thy researches after thy lost sister and the maiden whom thy loves the ships of leghorn trade to constantinople whither i shall speedily return and it will not be a difficult matter to forward a letter to me occasionally i should be unworthy of the kind interest you take in my behalf great pasha were i to neglect this request answered francisco oh may the good angels grant that i may yet recover my beloved nisida and that sweetest of maidens flora francatelli francisco was too overpowered by his own emotions to observe the sudden start which ibrahim gave and the pallor which instantaneously overspread his cheeks as the name of his sister thus burst upon his lips that sister who beyond doubt and disappeared most strangely but with an almost superhuman effort he subdued any further expression of the agony of his feelings and taking francisco's hand said in a low deep tone count of riverola i rely upon your solemn promise to write to me and write soon and often 
i shall experience a lively pleasure in receiving and responding to your letters fear not that i shall forget my promise your highness responded francisco he then took leave of ibrahim pasha and returned to the city of rhodes whence he embarked on the same day for italy accompanied by the few florentine auxiliaries who had survived the dreadful slaughter on the ramparts the hustle and excitement attending the departure from rhodes somewhat absorbed the grief which ibrahim felt on account of the mysterious disappearance of his sister flora soliman left a sufficient force under an able commander to garrison the island which was speedily evacuated by villiers of al adam and his knights and by the middle of may the sultan attended by ibrahim and the other dignitaries of the empire once more entered the gates of constantinople not many days had elapsed when at the divan or state council at which soliman the magnificent himself presided ibrahim pasha was desired to give his opinion upon a particular question then under discussion the renegade expressed his sentiments in a manner at variance with the policy recommended by the grand vizier and this high functionary replied in terms of bitterness and even grossness at the same time reproaching ibrahim with ingratitude the apostate delivered a rejoinder which completely electrified the divan he repudiated the charge of ingratitude on the ground of being influenced only by his duty toward the sultan and he entered upon a complete review of the policy of the grand vizier piri pasha he proved that the commerce of the country had greatly fallen off that the revenues had diminished that arrears were due to the army and navy that several minor powers had not paid their usual tribute for some years past and in a word drew such a frightful picture of the maladministration and misrule that the grand vizier was overwhelmed with confusion and the sultan and other listeners were struck with the lamentable truth of all which had fallen from the lips of ibrahim pasha nor less were they astonished at the wonderful intimacy which he displayed with even the minutest details of the machinery of the government in a word his triumph was complete soliman the magnificent broke up the divan in haste ordering the members of the council to return each immediately to his own abode in the evening a functionary of the imperial household was sent to the palace of the grand vizier to demand the seals of office and thus fell piri pasha it was midnight when the sultan sent to order ibrahim pasha to wait upon him without delay the conference that ensued was long and interesting and it was already near daybreak when messengers were dispatched to the various members of the divan to summon them to the seraglio then in the presence of all the rank and talent in the capital the sultan demanded of ibrahim whether he felt sufficient confidence in himself to undertake the weight and responsibility of office all eyes were fixed earnestly upon that mere youth of scarcely twenty-three who was thus solemnly adjured in a firm voice he replied that with the favour of the sultan and the blessing of the most high he did not despair of being enabled to restore the ottoman empire to its late prosperity and glory the astronomer of the court declared that the hour was favourable to invest the new grand vizier with the insignia of office and at the moment when the call to prayer god is great sounded from every minaret in constantinople ibrahim pasha received the imperial seals from the hand of the sultan End of section forty nine Section fifty of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty nine. The new Grand Vizier. The call to prayer, God is great, sounded from every minaret in Constantinople when Soliman the Magnificent raised the renegade Ibrahim to a rank second only to his own imperial station the newly appointed prime minister received the congratulations of the assembled dignitaries of the empire and when this ceremony was accomplished he repaired to the palace of the visa ship which piri pasha had vacated during the night a numerous escort of slaves and a guard of honour composed of an entire company of janizaries attended ibrahim to his new abode the streets through which he passed being lined with spectators anxious to obtain a glimpse of the new minister but calm almost passionless was the expression of ibrahim's countenance though he had attained to his present high station speedily yet he had not reached it unexpectedly and even in the moment of this his proud triumph there was gall mingled with the cup of honey which he quaffed for oh the light of christianity was not extinguished within his breast and though it no longer gleamed there to inspire and to cheer it nevertheless had strength enough to burn with reproachful flame the multitudes cheered and prostrated themselves as he passed but his salutation was cold and indifferent and he felt at that moment that he would rather have been wandering through the vale of arno 
hand in hand with his sister than be welcomed in the streets of constantinople as the grand vizier of the ottoman empire o crime thou mayst deck thy brow with flowers and adorn thy garments with the richest gems thou mayst elicit the shouts of admiring myriads and proceed attended by guards ready to hew down those who would treat thee with disrespect thou mayst quit the palace of a mighty sovereign to repair to a palace of thine own and in thy hands thou mayst hold the destinies of millions of human beings but thou canst not subdue the still small voice that whispers reproachfully in thine ear nor pluck from thy bosom the undying worm though ibrahim pasha felt acutely yet his countenance as we have before said expressed nothing he was still sufficiently master of his emotions to retain them pent up in his own breast and if he could not appear perfectly happy he would not allow the world to perceive that his soul harboured secret care he entered the palace now destined to become his abode and found himself the lord and master of an establishment such as no christian monarch in europe possessed but as he passed through marble halls and perfumed corridors lined with prostrate slaves as he contemplated the splendour and magnificence the wealth and the luxury by which he was now surrounded and as he even dwelt upon the hope nay the more than hope the conviction that he should full soon be blessed with the hand of a being whose ravishing beauty was ever present to his mental vision that still small voice which he could not hush appeared to ask what avail it was for a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul but ibrahim pasha was not the man to give way to the influence of even reflections so harrowing as these and he immediately applied himself to the business of the state to divert his mind from unpleasurable meditations holding a levy that same day he received and confirmed in their offices all the subordinate ministers he then dispatched letters to the various governors of the provinces to announce to them his elevation to the grand viziership and he conferred the pashlik of egypt upon the fallen minister piri pasha in the afternoon he granted audiences to the ambassadors of the christian powers but the florentine envoy it should be observed had quitted constantinople some weeks previously indeed at the time when the sultan undertook his expedition against rhodes for the representative of the republic had entirely failed in the mission which had been entrusted to him by his government in the evening when it was quite dark ibrahim retired to his apartment and hastily disguising himself in a mean attire he issued forth by a private gate at the back part of the palace intent upon putting into execution a scheme which he had hastily planned that very afternoon he repaired to the quarter inhabited by the christians there he entered a house of humble appearance where dwelt a young greek with whom he had been on friendly terms at that period when his present greatness was totally unforeseen indeed while he was simply the private secretary of the florentine envoy he knew that demetrius was poor intelligent and trustworthy and it was precisely an agent of this nature that ibrahim required for the project which he had in view demetrius such was the young greek's name was seated in a small and meanly furnished apartment in a desponding manner and scarcely appearing to notice the efforts which his sister a beautiful maiden of nineteen was exerting to console him when the door opened and a man dressed as a water-carrier entered the room the young greek started up angrily for he thought the visitor was one of the numerous petty creditors to whom he was indebted and those demands he was unable to liquidate but the second glance which he cast by the light of the lamp that burnt feebly on the table toward the countenance of the meanly dressed individual convinced him of his mistake his highness the grand vizier ejaculated demetrius falling on his knees galante he added speaking rapidly to his sister bow down to the representative of the sultan but ibrahim hastened to put an end to this ceremony and assured the brother and sister that he came thither as a friend a friend repeated demetrius as if doubting whether his ears had heard aright is it possible that heaven has indeed sent me a friend in one who has the power to raise me and this poor suffering maiden from the depths of our bitter bitter poverty dost thou suppose that my rapid elevation has rendered me unmindful of former friendships demanded ibrahim although had he not his own purposes to serve he would never have thought of seeking the abode nor inquiring after the welfare of the humble acquaintance of his obscure days the young greek knew not however the thorough selfishness of the renegade's character and he poured forth his gratitude for the vizier's kindness and condensation with the most sincere and heartfelt fever 
while the beauteous Calanthe's large dark eyes swam in tears of hope and joy, as she surveyed with mingled wonder and admiration the countenance of that high functionary whose rapid rise to power had electrified the Ottoman capital, and whom she now saw for the first time. Demetrius, said Ibrahim, I know your worth, I have appreciated your talents, and I feel deeply for the orphan condition of your sister and yourself. It is in my power to afford you an employment whereby you may render me good service, and which shall be liberally rewarded. You are already acquainted with much of my former history, and you have often heard me speak, in terms of love and affection, of my sister Flora. During my recent sojourn in the island of Rhodes, a Florentine nobleman, the Count of Riverola, became my prisoner. From him I learned that he was attached to my sister, and his language led me to believe that he was loved in return. But alas, some few months ago Flora suddenly disappeared, and the Count of Riverola instituted a vain search to discover her. Too pure-minded was she to fly of her own accord from her native city, too chaste and too deeply imbued with virtuous principles was she to admit the suspicion that she had fled with a vile seducer. No force or treachery, if not murder, added Ibrahim, in a tone indicative of profound emotion, must have caused her sudden disappearance. The Count of Riverola has doubtless ere now arrived in Italy, and his researches will most assuredly be renewed. He promised to communicate to me the result, but as he knew not to whom the pledge was given, as he recognised not in me the brother of the Flora whom he loves, I am fearful lest he forget or neglect the promise. It is, therefore, my intention to send a secret agent to Florence, an agent who will convey rich gifts to my aunt, but without revealing the name of him who sends them an agent in a word who may minister to the wants and interests of my family and report to me whether my beloved sister be yet found and if so the causes of her disappearance it seems to me that you demetrius are well fitted for this mission your knowledge of the italian language your discreetness your sound judgment all render you competent to enact the part of a good genius watching over the interests of those who must not be allowed to learn whence flow the bounties which suddenly pour upon them gracious lord said the young greek his countenance radiant with joy i will never lose any opportunity of manifesting my devotion to the cause in which your highness condescends to employ me you will proceed alone to italy continued ibrahim and on your arrival in florence you will adopt a modest and reserved mode of life so that no unpleasant inquiries may arise as to your object in visiting the republic Demetrius turned a rapidly inquiring glance upon Calanthe, who hastened to observe that she did not fear being left unprotected in the city of Constantinople. Ibrahim placed a heavy purse and a case containing many costly jewels in the hands of Demetrius, saying, These are as an earnest of my favour and friendship. Then producing a second case, tied round with a silken cord, he added, And this is for my aunt, the Signora Francatelli. Demetrius promised to attend to all the instructions which he had received, and Ibrahim Pasha took his leave of the brother and the charming sister, the latter of whom conveyed to him the full extent of her gratitude for his kindness and condensation toward them in a few words uttered in a subdued tone, but with all the eloquence of her fine dark eyes. "'Did I not love my unknown protectress?' murmured Ibrahim to himself, as he sped rapidly back to his palace. "'I might feel that Calanthe's eyes would make an impression upon my heart.' scarcely had he resumed his magnificent garb on his return home when a slave announced to him that his imperial majesty the sultan required his immediate attendance at the seraglio whither he was to repair in the most private manner possible a sudden misgiving darted through ibrahim's imagination could soliman have repented of the step which he had taken in thus suddenly elevating him to the pinnacle of power was his viziership to last but a few short hours had the secret influence which had hitherto protected him, ceased. Considering the times and the country in which he lived, these fears were justifiable, and it was with a rapidly beating heart that the new minister hastened, attended only by a single slave, to the dwelling of his imperial master. But when he was ushered into the presence of the sultan, his own slave remaining in the ante-room, his apprehensions were dissipated by the smiling countenance with which the monarch greeted him. Having signalled his attendants to retire, Soliman the Magnificent addressed the Grand Vizier in the following manner. Thy great talents, thy zeal in our service, and the salvation which I owe to thee in the breach up roads, have been instrumental, O Ibrahim, in raising thee to thy present high state, 
but the bounties of the sultan are without end as the mercy of allah is imitable thou hast doubtless heard that among my numerous sisters there is one of such unrivalled beauty such peerless loveliness that the world hath not seen her equal happy may the man deem himself on whom the fair aischa shall be bestowed and thou art that happy man ibrahim and aischa is thine the grand vizier threw himself at the feet of his imperial master and murmured expressions of gratitude but his heart sank within him for he knew that in marrying the sultan's sister he should not be allowed the enjoyment of the mussulman's privilege of polygamy and thus his hopes of possessing the beautiful unknown to whom he owed so much appeared to hover on the verge of annihilation but might not that unknown lady and the beauteous aischa be one and the same person the unknown was evidently the mistress of an influence almost illimitable and was it not natural to conceive that she then must be the sister of the sultan again the sultan had many sisters and the one who had exerted her interest for ibrahim might not be the princess aischa who was now promised to him all these conjectures and conflicting speculations passed through the mind of ibrahim in far less time than we have taken to describe their nature and he was cruelly the prey to mingled hope and alarm when the sultan exclaimed rise my vizier as then and follow me the apostate obeyed with beating heart and suleiman the magnificent conducted him along several passages and corridors to a splendidly furnished room which ibrahim immediately recognized as the very one in which he had been admitted many months previously to an interview with the beauteous unknown yes that was the apartment in which he had listened to the eloquence of her soft persuasive voice it was there that intoxicated with passion he had abjured the faith of a christian and embraced the creed of the false prophet mohammed after reclining on the very sofa where he had first seen her but attended by a troop of charming female slaves was the fair unknown his secret protectress more lovely more bewitching than she appeared when they last met an arch smile played upon her lips as she rose from the magnificent cushions a smile which seemed to say i have kept my word i have raised thee to the highest power save one in the ottoman empire and i will now crown thy happiness by giving thee my hand and oh so beauteous so ravishingly lovely did she appear as that smile revealed teeth whiter than the oriental pearls which she wore and as a slight flush on her damask cheek and the bright flashing of her eyes betrayed the joy and triumph which filled her heart so elegant and graceful was her faultless form which the gorgeous ottoman garb so admirably became that ibrahim forgot all his recent compunction lost sight of home and friends remembered not the awful apostasy of which he had been guilty but fell upon his knees in adoration of that charming creature while the sultan with a smile which showed that he was no stranger to the mysteries of the past exclaimed in a benignant tone vizier azam receive the hand of my well-beloved sister aischa end of section fifty Section fifty one of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty. The Count of Aristino. The plot thickens. Return we now to the fair city of flowers, to thee, delightful Florence, vine crowned queen of Tuscany. The summer has come, and the gardens are brilliant with dyes and hues of infinite variety. The hills and valleys are clothed in their brightest emerald garment and the arno winds its peaceful way between banks blushing with choicest fruits of the earth but though gay that july scene though glorious in its splendour that unclouded summer sun though gorgeous the balconies filled with flowers and brilliant the parterres of tuscan roses yet gloomy was the countenance and dark were the thoughts of the count of aristino as he paced with agitated steps one of the splendid apartments of his palace the old man was actually endowed with a good a generous a kind and forgiving disposition but the infidelity of his wife the being on whom he had so doted and who was once his joy and his pride that infidelity had warped his best feelings soured his temper and aroused the dark spirit of vengeance she lives she lives he murmured to himself pausing for a moment to press his feverish hand to his heated brow she lives and doubtless under the protection of her paramour but i shall know more presently antonio is faithful he will not deceive me and the count resumed his agitated walk up and down the room a few minutes elapsed when the door opened slowly and antonio whom the reader may remember to have been a valet in the service of the riverola family 
made his appearance. The Count hastened toward him, exclaiming, What news, Antonio? Speak, hast thou learnt aught more of, of her? My lord, answered the valet, closing the door behind him. I have ascertained everything. The individual who spoke darkly and mysteriously to me last evening has within this hour made me acquainted with many strange things. But the countess, I mean the guilty, fallen creature who once bore my name, ejaculated the old nobleman, his voice trembling with impatience. There is no doubt, my lord, that her ladyship lives, and that she is still in Florence, answered Antonio. The shameless woman, cried the Count of Aristino, his unusually pale face becoming perfectly death-like through the violence of his inward emotions. "'But how know you all this?' demanded his lordship, suddenly turning toward the dependent. "'Who is your informant, and can he be relied on? Remember, I took thee into my service at thine own solicitation. I have no guarantee for thy fidelity, and I am influential to punish as well as rich to reward.' "'Your lordship has bound me to you by ties of gratitude,' responded Antonio. "'For when discarded suddenly by the young Count of Riverola, "'I found in Aslam and employment in your lordship's palace. "'It is your lordship's bounty which has enabled me to give bread to my aged mother, "'and I should be a villain were I to deceive you.' "'I believe you, Antonio,' said the Count. "'And now tell me how you are assured that the Countess escaped from the conflagration and ruin of the institution to which my just vengeance had consigned her. How, too, you have learned that she is still in Florence?' "'I have ascertained, my lord, beyond all possibility of doubt,' answered the valet, "'that the assailants of the convent were a terrible horde of banditti, at that time headed by Stefano Verina, who had since disappeared no one knows whither.' that the marquis of orsini was one of the leaders in the awful deed of sacrilege and that her ladyship the countess and a young maiden named flora francatelli were rescued by the robbers from their cells in the establishment these ladies and the marquis quitted the stronghold of the banditti together blindfolded and guided forth by that same stefano verina whom i mentioned just now lomellino the present captain of the horde and another bandit and who is your informant how learned you all this demanded the count trembling with the excitement of painful reminiscences reawakened and with the hope of speedy vengeance on the guilty pair his wife and the marquis my lord said antonio pardon me if i remain silent but i dare not compromise the man antonio exclaimed the count wrathfully you are deceiving me tell me who was your informant i command you hesitate not my lord my lord cried the valet is it not enough that i prove my assertions that i no cried the nobleman i have seen so much duplicity where all appeared to be innocence so much deceit where all wore the aspect of integrity that i can trust man no more how know i for certain that all this may not be some idle tale which you yourself have forged to induce me to put confidence in you to entrust you with gold to bribe your pretended informant but which will really remain in your own pocket speak antonio tell me all or i shall listen to you no more and your servitude in this mansion then ceases i will speak frankly my lord replied the valet but in the course you may adopt fear not for yourself nor for your informant antonio interrupted the count impatiently be ye both lead with the banditti yourselves or be ye allied to the fiends of hell he added with fiercer emphasis i care not so long as i can render ye the instruments of my vengeance good my lord exclaimed antonio delighted with this assurance and now i can speak fearlessly and frankly my informant is that other bandit who accompanied stefano verina and lomellino when the countess flora and the marquis were conducted blindfolded from the robbers stronghold but while they were yet all inmates of that stronghold this same bandit, whose name is Venturo, overheard the Marquis inform Stefano Verina that he intended to remain in Florence to obtain the liberation of a Jew who was imprisoned in the dungeons of that Inquisition, and this Jew, Venturo also learnt by subsequent inquiry from Verina, is a certain Isaacar ben Solomon. Isaacar ben Solomon, ejaculated the Count, the whole incident of the diamonds returning with all its painful details to his mind. Oh, no wonder, he added bitterly that the marquis has so much kindness for him but proceed proceed antonio i was about to inform your lordship continued the valet 
at venturo of whom i have spoken happened the next day to overhear the marquis inform the countess that he should be compelled to stay for that purpose in florence whereupon flora francatelli offered her ladyship a home at her aunt's residence whither she herself should return on her liberation from the stronghold then it was that the maiden mentioned to the countess the name of her family and when vinjoro represented all these facts to me just now i at once knew who this same flora francatelli is and where she dwells you know where she dwells cried the count joyfully then guilia the false the faithless the perjured guilia is in my power unless indeed he added more slowly unless she may have removed to another place of abode that my lord shall be speedily ascertained said antonio i will instruct my mother to call on some pretexts at the cottage inhabited by dame francatelli and she will soon learn whether there be another female resident there besides the aunt and the niece flora do so antonio exclaimed the count let no unnecessary delay take place here is gold much gold for thee to divide between thyself and the bandit informant see that thou art faithful to my interests and that sum shall prove but a small earnest of what thy reward will be the valet secured about his person the well-fitted purse that was handed to him and retired the count of arestini remained alone to brood over his plans of vengeance it was horrible horrible to behold that aged and venerable man trembling as he was on the verge of eternity now meditating schemes of dark and dire revenge but his wrongs were great wrongs which though common enough in that voluptuous italian clime and especially in that age and city of licentiousness and debauchery were not the less sure to be followed by a fearful retribution where retribution was within the reach of him who was outraged ha ha he chuckled fearfully to himself as he now paced the room with a lighter step as if joy filled his heart all those who have injured me are within the reach of my vengeance the jew in the inquisition the marquis open to a charge of diabolical sacrilege and guilia assuredly in florence i dealt too leniently with that jew i sent to pay for the redemption of jewels which were my own property all my life have i been a just a humane a merciful man i will be so no more the world's doings are adverse to generosity and fair dealing in my old age have i learnt this oh the perfidy of woman toward a doting a confiding a fond heart works strange alterations in the heart of the deceived one i who but a year nay six months ago would not harm the meanest reptile that crawls now thirst for vengeance vengeance repeated the old man in a shrieking hysterical tone upon those who have wronged me i will exterminate them all at one fell swoop exterminate them all all and his voice rang screechingly and wildly through the lofty room of that splendid mansion End of section 51 Section 52 of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 51 The Meeting On the bank of the Arno, in a somewhat retired situation, stood a neat cottage in the midst of a little garden, surrounded by no formal pile of bricks to constitute a wall, were protected only by its own sweet hedge or fragrant shrubs and blooming plants over the portico of the humble but comfortable tenement twined the honeysuckle and the clematis and the sides of the building were almost completely veiled by the vines amidst the verdant foliage of which appeared large hunches of purple grapes at an open casement on the ground floor an elderly female very plainly but very neatly attired and wearing a placid smile and a good-natured expression upon a countenance which had once been handsome sat watching the glorious spectacle of the setting sun the orb of day went down in a flood of purple and gold behind the western hills and now the dame began suddenly to cast uneasy glances toward the path that led along the bank of the river but the maiden for whose return the good aunt felt anxious was not far distant indeed flora francatelli wearing a thick veil over her head was already proceeding homeward after a short ramble by the margin of the stream when the reverie in which she was plunged was interrupted by the sounds of hasty footsteps behind ever fearful of treachery since the terrible incident of her imprisonment in the carmelite convent she redoubled her speed blaming herself for having been beguiled by the beauty of the evening to prolong her walk farther than she intended on setting out when the increasing haste of the footsteps behind her excited the keenest alarms within her bosom 
for she felt now convinced that she was pursued. The cottage was already in sight, and a hundred paces only separated her from its door, when a well-known voice, a voice which caused every fibre in her heart to thrill with surprise and joy, exclaimed, "'Flora, beloved one, fly not, oh, I could not be deceived in the symmetry of thy form, the graciousness of thy gait, I knew it was thou.' and in another moment the maiden was clasped in the arms of Francisco, Count of Riverola. Impossible were it to describe the ecstatic bliss of this meeting, a meeting so unexpected on either side, for a minute before Flora had deemed the young nobleman to be far away, fighting in the cause of the cross, while Francisco was proceeding to make inquiries at the cottage concerning his beloved, but with a heart that scarcely dared nourish a hope for her reappearance. "'Oh, my well-beloved Flora!' exclaimed francisco and are we indeed thus blessed or is it a delusive dream but tell me sweet maiden tell me whether thou hast ceased to think of me from whose memory thine image has never been absent since the date of thy sudden and mysterious disappearance flora could not reply in words her heart was too full for the utterance of her feelings but as she raised the veil from her charming countenance the tears of joy which stood upon her long lashes, and the heavenly smile which played upon her lips, and the deep blushes which overspread her cheeks, spoke far more eloquently of unaltered affection than all the vows and pledges which might have flowed from the tongue. "'Thou lovest me, lovest me, lovest me still!' exclaimed the enraptured Count, again clasping her in his arms, and now imprinting innumerable kisses on her lips, her cheeks, and her fair brow. Hasty explanations speedily ensued, and Francisco now learnt for the first time the cause of Flora's disappearance, her incarceration in the convent, and the particulars of her release. "'But who could have been the author of that outrage?' exclaimed the Count, his cheeks flushing with indignation, and his hand instinctively grasping his sword. "'Whom could you, sweet maiden, have offended? What fiend thus vented his malignity on thee?' "'Hold, my lord,' cried Flora, in a beseeching tone. "'Perhaps you—' and she checked herself abruptly. "'Call me not my lord, dearest maiden,' said the Count. "'To thee I am Francisco, as thou to me art Flora, my own beloved Flora. But wherefore didst thou stop short thus? Wherefore not conclude the sentence that was half uttered? O oh, Flora, a terrible suspicion strikes me. Speak, relieve me from the cruel suspicion under which I now labour.' Was it my sister, my much-lamented sister, who did thee that foul wrong? I know not, replied Flora, weeping. But, alas, pardon me, dear Francisco, if I suspect aught so bad of any one connected with thee, and yet heaven knows how freely, how sincerely I forgive my enemy. Her voice was lost in sobs, and her head drooped on her lover's breast. Weep not, dearest one, exclaimed Francisco let not our meeting be rendered mournful with tears thou knowest perhaps that nisida disappeared as suddenly and as mysteriously as thou didst but could she also have become the victim of the carmelites and did she alas perish in the ruins of the convent i am well assured that the lady nisida was not doomed to that fate answered flora but had she been consigned to the convent as a punishment for some real offence or on some groundless charge, she must have passed the ordeal of the chamber of penitence, where I should have seen her. Yes, Francisco, I have heard of her mysterious disappearance, and I have shed many, many tears, when I have thought of her, poor lady, although, added the maiden, in a low and plaintive tone, I fear, Francisco, that it was indeed she who doomed me to that monastic dungeon. Doubtless her keen perception, far more keen than in those who are blessed with the faculties which were lost to her, enabled her to penetrate the secret of that affection with which you had honoured me, and in which I felt so much happiness. I confessed my love to Nisida, interrupted Francisco, but it was not until your disappearance I was driven to despair, Flora. I was mad with grief, and I could not, neither did I, attempt to conceal my emotion, I told Nisida all, and well, oh, well, do I recollect the reply which she gave me, giving fond assurance that my happiness alone would be consulted. Alas, was there no double meaning in that assurance? asked Flora gently. 
the lady nisida knew well how inconsistent with your high rank your proud fortunes your great name was that love which you bore for a humble and obscure girl a love which i shall not be ashamed to own in the sight of all florence exclaimed francisco in an impassioned tone but if nisida were the cause of that cruel outrage on thee my flora we will forgive her for she could have acted only through conscientious though most mistaken motives mistaken indeed for never could i have known happiness again hadst thou not been restored to me it was to wean my mind from pondering the afflictions that goaded me to despair that i embarked in the cause of christendom against the encroachments of moslem power thinking that thou wast for ever lost to me that my sister also had become the victim of some murderous hand harassed by doubts the most cruel and uncertainty the most agonizing i sought death on the walls of rhodes but the destroying angel's arrow rebounded from my corslet his sword was broken against my shield during my voyage back to italy after beholding the crescent planted on the walls where the christian standard had floated for so many many years a storm overtook the ship and yet the destroying angel gave me not the death i courted this evening i once more set foot in florence from my own mansion nisida is still absent and no tidings have been received of her alas is she then lost to me for ever without tarrying even to change my travel-soiled clothes i set out to make inquiries concerning another whom i love and that other is thyself here thanks to a merciful heaven my heart has not been doomed to experience a second and equally cruel disappointment for i have found thee at last my flora and henceforth my arm shall protect thee from peril how have i deserved so much kindness at thine hands murmured the maiden again drooping her blushing head and oh what will you think francisco what will you say when you learn that i was there there in that cottage with my aunt when you called the last time to inquire if any tidings had been received of me you were there exclaimed francisco starting back in surprise not unmingled with anger you were there flora and you knew that i was in despair concerning thee that i would have given worlds to have heard of thy safety i who thought that some fiend in human shape had sent thee to an early grave forgive me francisco forgive me cried flora bursting into tears but it was not my fault on the night following the one in which the banditti stormed the convent as i ere now detailed to your ears i returned home to my aunt when the excitement of our meeting was past and when we were alone together i threw myself at her feet confessed all that had passed between thee and me and implored her advice flora she said while her tears fell upon me as i knelt no happiness will come to thee my child from this attachment which had already plunged thee into so much misery it was beyond all doubt that the relations of the count were the authors of thy imprisonment and their persecutions would only be renewed were they to learn that the count was made aware of your reappearance in florence for thy sake then my child i shall suffer the impression of thy continued absence and loss to remain on the minds of those who may inquire concerning thee and should his lordship call here again most especially to him shall i appear stricken with grief on account of thee his passion my child is one of boyhood effervescent though ardent while it endures he will soon forget thee and when he shall have learnt to love another there will no longer be any necessity for thee to live an existence of concealment thus spoke my aunt dear francisco and i dared not gainsay her when you came the last time i heard your voice i listened from my chamber door to all you said to my aunt and i longed to fly into your arms you went away and my heart was nearly broken some days afterward we learnt the strange disappearance of the lady nisida and then knew that you must have received a severe blow for i was well aware how much you loved her two or three weeks elapsed and then we heard that you were about to depart to the wars oh how bitter were the tears that i shed how fervent were the prayers that i offered up for your safety and those prayers have been heard on high beloved one exclaimed francisco 
who had listened with melting heart and returning tenderness to the narrative which the maiden told so simply but so sincerely and in the most plaintive tones of her musical voice can you forgive me now asked the blushing maiden her swimming eyes bending on her lover glances eloquently expressive of hope i have nothing to forgive sweet girl replied francisco your aunt behaved with a prudence which in justice i cannot condemn and you acted with an obedience and submission to your venerable relative which i could not be arbitrary enough to blame we have both endured much for each other my flora but the days of our trials are past and your good aunt will be convinced that in giving your young heart to me you have not confided in one who is undeserving of so much love let us hasten into her presence but one question i have yet to ask you he added suddenly recollecting an idea which had ere now made some impression on his mind you informed me how you were liberated from the convent and you mentioned the name of the countess of aristino whom circumstances have made your companion in that establishment and to whom your aunt gave an aslam know you not dearest flora that fame reports not well of that same guilia of aristino and that a woman of tarnished reputation is no fitting associate for an innocent and artless maiden such as thou during the period that the lady of aristino and myself were companions in captivity responded flora with a frankness as amiable as it was convincing she never in the most distant manner alluded to her love for the marquis of orsini when the marquis appeared in the convent in company with the robbers i was far too much bewildered with the passing events to devote a thought to what might be the nature of their connection and even when i had more leisure for reflection during the entire day which i passed in the stronghold of the banditti i saw naught in it save what i conceived to be the bond of close relationship i offered her ladyship an aslam at the abode of my aunt as i should have given a home under such circumstances to the veriest wretch crawling on the face of the earth but in that cottage the countess and myself have not continued in close companionship for my aunt accidentally learnt that fame reported not well of the lady of aristino and in a gentle manner she begged her to seek another home at her earliest leisure the countess implored my venerable relative to permit her to remain at the cottage as her life would be in danger were she not afforded a sure and safe aslam moved by her earliest entreaties my aunt assented and the countess has almost constantly remained in her own chamber sometimes but very rarely she goes forth after dusk and in a deep disguise the marquis has not however visited the cottage since my aunt made this discovery relative to the reputation of the lady of aristino thanks charming flora for that explanation cried the young count let us now hasten to thine aunt and in her presence i will renew to thee all the vows of unalterable and honourable affection which my heart suggests as a means of proving that i am worthy of thy love and hand in hand that fine young noble and that beauteous blushing maiden proceeded to the cottage two persons concealed in an adjacent grove had overheard every syllable of the above conversation these were the valet antonio and his mother dame margaretha at whose dwelling it will be recollected the unfortunate agnes had so long resided under the protection of the late count of riverola this is fortunate mother said antonio when francisco and flora had retired from the vicinity of the grove you are spared the trouble of a visit to the old signora francatelli and i have learned sufficient to enable me to work out all my plans alike of aggrandizement and revenge let us retrace our way into the city thou wilt return to thy home and i shall hence straight to the lord count of aristino End of section 52. Section 53 of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 52. The Greek Page, Song of the Greek Page, A Revelation. Three months had now elapsed since Ibrahim Pasha had risen to the exalted rank of Grand Vizier and had married the sister of Soliman the Magnificent. The Sultan daily became more attached to him and he on his part acquired influence over his imperial master vested with a power so nearly absolute that soliman signed without ever pursuing the hatti sheriffs or decrees drawn up by ibrahim and enjoying the confidence of the divan all the members of which were devoted to his interests 
the renegade administered according to his own discretion the affairs of that mighty empire avaricious and ever intent upon the aggrandizement of his own fortunes he accumulated vast treasures but he also maintained a household and lived in a style unequalled by any of his predecessors in office having married a sister of the sultan he was not permitted a plurality of wives but he purchased the most beauteous slaves for his harem and plunged headlong into a vortex of dissipation and pleasure for some weeks he had manifested the most ardent and impassioned attachment towards aistia who during that period was happy in the belief that she alone possessed his heart but the customs of the east as well as the duties of his office kept them so much apart that he had no leisure to discover the graces of her mind nor to appreciate all the powers of her naturally fine and indeed well cultivated intellect so that the beauty of her person constituted the only basis on which his affection was maintained the fervour of such a love soon cooled with satiety and those female slaves whom he had at first procured as indispensable appendages to his rank and station were not long in becoming the sources of new pleasure and voluptuous enjoyment aistia beheld his increasing indifference and strove to bind him to her by representing all she had done for him he listened coldly at first but when on several occasions the same remonstrances were repeated he answered angrily had it not been for my influence she said to him one day when the dispute had become more serious than preceding quarrels of the kind you might still have been an humble secretary to a christian noble not so replied the grand vizier for at the very time when i first beheld thee in the bezestine certain offers had been secretly conveyed to me from the rezi effendi in whose service would you have lingered as a mere subordinate for long long years returned aistia it was i who urged you on have i not assured you that your image dwelt in my memory after the accident which first led to our meeting that one of my faithful women noticed my thoughtful mood and that when i confessed to her the truth she stated to me that by a singular coincidence her own brother was employed by the rezi effendi as an agent to tempt you with the offers to which you have alluded then inquiries which my slave instituted brought to my ears the flattering tidings that you also thought of me and i resolved to grant you an interview from that moment my influence hurried you on to power and when you became the favourite of the mighty soliman i confessed to him that i had seen and that i had loved you his returnal attachment to me is great greater than to any other of his sisters seeing that himself and i were born of the same mother though at a long interval thus it was that my persuasion made him think higher and oftener of you than he would else have done and now that you have attained the summit of glory and power she who has helped to raise you is neglected and loved no longer cease these reproaches aistia exclaimed ibrahim who had listened impatiently to her long address or i'll give thee less of my company than heretofore see that the next time i visit thee my reception may be with smiles instead of tears with sweet words instead of reproaches and in this cruel manner the heartless renegade quitted his beauteous wife leaving her plunged in the most profound affliction but as ibrahim traversed the corridors leading to his own apartments his heart smote him for the harshness and unfeeling nature of his conduct and as one disagreeable idea by disposing the spirits to melancholy usually arouses others that were previously slumbering in the cells of the brain all the turpitude of his apostasy was recalled with new force to his mind repairing to a small but magnificently furnished saloon in a retired part of the palace he dismissed the slaves who were waiting at the door ordering them however to send into his presence a young greek page who had recently entered his service in a few minutes the youth made his appearance and stood in a respectful attitude near the door come and sit at my feet constantine said the grand vizier and thou shalt sing to me one of those airs of thy native greece with which thou hast occasionally delighted mine ears i know not how it is boy but thy presence pleases me and thy voice soothes my soul when oppressed with the cares of my high office joy flashed from the bright black eyes of the young greek page as he glided noiselessly over the thick carpet but that emotion of pleasure was instantly changed to one of deep deference proceed said his master and sing me that plaintive song which is supposed to depict the woes of one of the unhappy sons of greece but may not its sentiments offend your highness asked the page it is but a song responded ibrahim i give thee full permission to sing those verses and i should be sorry were you to subdue aught of the impassioned feelings which they are well calculated to excite within thee the page turned his handsome countenance up toward the grand vizier and commenced in melodious liquid tones the following song 
Song of the Greek Page Oh, are there not beings condemned from their birth To drag without solace or hope o'er the earth The burden of grief and of sorrow? Doomed wretches who know, while they trembling say, The star of my fate appears brighter to-day, That it is but a brief and a mocking ray, To make darkness darker to-morrow. And tis not the vile and base alone, That unchanging grief and sorrow are known, But as oft to the pure and guileless. And he from whom fervid and generous lip Gush words of the kindest fellowship, of the same pure fountain may not sip in return but it is sad and smileless yes such doomed mortals alas there be and mine is that self-same destiny the fate of the lorn and lonely for e'en in my childhood's early day the comrades i sought would turn away and of all the band from the sportive play was i thrust and excluded only when fifteen summers had passed o'er my head I stood on the battlefield strewn with the dead, for the day of the Moslem's glory, had made me an orphan child, and there, my sire was stretched, and his bosom bare, showed a gaping wound, and the flowing hair of his head was damp and gory. My sire was the chief of the patriot band, that had fought and died for their native land, when her rightful prince betrayed her. On his kith and kin did the vengeance fall, of the Mussulman foes and each and all were swept from the old ancestral hall save myself by the fierce invader and i was spared from that blood-stained grave to be dragged away as the Mussulman slave and bend to the foe victorious but o oh greece to thee does my memory turn its longing eyes and my heart-strings yearn to behold thee rise in thy might and spurn as of yore thy yoke inglorious but oh whither has spartan courage fled and why proud athens above thine head is the Mussulman crescent gleaming have thine ancient memories no avail and art thou not fired at the legend tale which reminds thee how the whole world grew pale and recoiled from thy banner streaming enough boy exclaimed ibrahim then in a low tone he murmured to himself the Christians have indeed much cause to anathemize the encroachments and tyranny of the Moslems. There was a short pause, during which the Grand Vizier was absorbed in profound meditation, while the Greek page never once withdrew his eyes from the countenance of that high functionary. Boy, at length said Ibrahim, you appear attached to me. I have observed many proofs of your devotion during the few months that you have been in my service. Speak, is there aught that I can do to make you happy? Have you relations or friends who need protection? If they be poor, I will relieve their necessities. My lips cannot express the gratitude which my heart feels towards your highness, returned the page, but I have no friends in behalf of whom I might supplicate the bounty of your highness. Are you happy yourself, Constantine? asked Ibrahim. Happy in being permitted to attend upon your highness, was the reply, delivered in a soft and tremulous tone but is it in my power to render you happier demanded the grand vizier constantine hung down his head reflected for a few moments and then murmured yes then by heaven exclaimed ibrahim pasha thou hast only to name thy request and it will be granted i know not wherefore but i am attached to thee much i feel interested in thy welfare and i would be rejoiced to minister to thy happiness i am already happier than i was happier because my lips have drunk in such words flowing from the lips of one who is exalted as highly as i am insignificant and humble said the page in a voice tremulous with emotion but sweetly musical yes i am happier he continued and yet my soul is filled with the image of a dear a well-beloved sister who pines in loneliness and solitude ever dwelling on a hapless love which she has formed for one who knows not that he is so loved and who perhaps may never never know it ah thou hast a sister constantine exclaimed the grand vizier and is she as lovely as a sister of a youth so handsome as thou ought to be she has been assured by those who have sought her hand that she is indeed beautiful answered constantine but of what avail are her charms since he whom she loves may never whisper in her ear the delicious words i love thee in return does the object of her affections possess so obdurate a heart inquired the grand vizier strangely interested in the discourse of his youthful page it is not that he scorns my sister's love 
replied constantine but it is that he knows not of his existence it is true that he has seen her once yet twere probable that he remembers not there is such a being in the world thus came it to pass my lord an officer holding a high rank in the service of his imperial majesty the great soliman had occasion to visit a humble dwelling wherein my sister resided she poor silly maiden was so struck by his almost godlike beauty so dazzled by his fascinating address so enchanted by the sound of his voice that she surrendered up her heart suddenly and secretly surrendered it up beyond all power of reclamation since then she has never ceased to ponder upon this fatal passion this unhappy love she has nursed his image in her mind until her reason has rocked with the wild thoughts the ardent hopes the emotions of despair all the conflicting sentiments of feeling in a word which so ardent and so strange love must naturally engender enthusiastic yet tender fervent yet melting in her soul and while she does not attempt to close her eyes to the conviction that she is cherishing a passion which is preying upon her very vitals she nevertheless clings to it as a martyr to the stake oh my lord canst thou marvel if i feel deeply for my unhappy sister but wherefore doth she remain thus unhappy demanded ibrahim pasha surely there are means of conveying to the object of her attachment an intimation how deeply he is beloved and he must be something more than human he added in an impassioned tone if he can remain obdurate to the tears and sighs of a beauteous creature such as thy sister doubtless is and were he to spurn her from him oh your highness it would kill her said the page fixing his large eloquent eyes upon the countenance of the grand vizier consider his exalted rank and her humble position doth she aspire to become his wife asked ibrahim she would be contented to serve him as his very slave responded constantine now strangely excited were he but to look kindly upon her she would deem herself blessed in receiving a smile from his lips so long as it was bestowed as a reward for all the tender love she bears him who is this man that is so fortunate as to have excited so profound an interest in the heart of one so beautiful demanded the grand vizier name him to me i will order him to appear before me and for thy sake i'll become an eloquent pleader on behalf of thy sister words cannot express the joy which flashed from the eyes of the page and animated his handsome though softly feminine countenance as casting himself on his knees at the feet of ibrahim pasha he murmured great lord that man whom my sister loves and for whom she would lay down her life is thyself ibrahim was for some minutes too much overcome by astonishment to offer an observation to utter a word while the page remained kneeling at his feet then suddenly it flashed to the mind of the grand vizier that the only humble abode which he had entered since he had become an officer holding a high rank in the service of soliman was that of his greek emissary demetrius and it now occurred to him that there was a striking likeness between the young page and the beautiful calanthe whom he had seen on that occasion constantine he said at length art thou then the brother of that demetrius whom i dispatched some three months ago to florence i am my lord and tis our sister calanthe of whom i have spoken was the reply oh pardon my arrogance my presumption great vizier he continued suddenly rising from his kneeling position and standing with his arms meekly folded across his breast pardon the arrogance the insolence of my conduct he exclaimed but it was for the sake of my sister that i sought service in the household of your highness i thought that if i could succeed in gaining your notice if in any way i could obtain such favour in your eyes as to be admitted to speak with one so highly raised above me as thou art i fancy that some opportunity would enable me to make those representations which have issued from my lips this day how patiently have i waited that occasion heaven knows how ardent have been my hopes of success when from time to time your highness singled me out from amongst the numerous free pages of your princely household to attend upon your privacy how ardent i say these hopes have been your highness may possibly divine and now my lord that i have succeeded in gaining your attention and pouring this secret into your ears i would away to calanthe and impart all the happiness that is in store for her though the flowers may hold up their heads high in the light of the glorious sun yet she shall hold hers higher in the favour of your smile generous master he added suddenly sinking his voice to a lower tone and reassuring the deferential air which he had partially lost in the excitement of speaking permit me now to depart this evening constantine said the grand vizier fixing his dark eyes significantly upon the page 
let your sister enter the harem by the private door in the garden here is a key i will give the necessary instructions to the female slaves to welcome her constantine received the key made a low obeisance and withdrew leaving the grand vizier to feast his voluptuous imagination with the delicious thoughts of the beauteous calanthe end of section fifty three